Hello and welcome to lecture number 10 in our series on drugs and human behavior. Today we're going to be talking about narcotic pain relievers, which are also known as opioid analgesics. These drugs are particularly of interest uh, at this time because there is such a widespread epidemic in opioid overdoses, opioid addiction, particularly uh, starting with painkillers, which then oftentimes uh, then graduates on to uh, use of heroin because oftentimes heroin is cheaper and more available. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. To give you some idea though about why this is such an important issue aside from the addiction problem is because chronic pain is a huge problem that really has to be dealt with. Total cost of pain uh, treatment and uh, loss of uh, productivity due to pain estimated in 2012 as being from $560 billion to $635 billion in 2010 dollars. Uh, the additional health care costs due to the pain range from $261 to $300 billion. The value of lost productivity due to pain range from about $300 billion to $335 billion. And the annual cost of pain was greater than the annual costs of heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So this is a huge problem that really requires us to take a careful look at because we have to have appropriate ways to treat people's pain, but we also have to be mindful of the costs of the potential for addiction. So this is a difficult issue to struggle with, one in which policymakers and doctors and patients are constantly struggling because we don't want to leave uh, patients in pain, uh, but we also don't want to subject people to the potential for addiction. So this is a huge problem we have to struggle with. So all of this data uh, comes from uh, an article called The Economic Cost of Pain in the United States. Uh, take a look at that for more details. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today uh, is we'll first talk about the psychology of pain perception, talk about then the history of opioids, get some terminology about what our opioids are, out of the way, talk about the opioid receptors, classification of opioid analgesics, talk in detail about morphine, then other pure opioid agonists, partial op opioid agonists, pure opioid antagonists, talk a little bit about genetic opioid metabolic defects, then talk about tolerance, dependence, and then finally end up with prescription uh, opioid abuse. Uh, then once we're done with all of that, we'll turn and talk to a little bit about some alternatives for pain treatment including uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or NSAIDs. So what is pain? Pain is both a sensory event of the peripheral and central nervous systems, as well as an emotional and cognitive experience. Acute pain is desirable uh, from a survival standpoint. It serves to warn us of damage, um, but chronic pain serves no purpose because it's just there all the time. It doesn't tell us something is wrong. But to give you an idea about how important acute pain is, occasionally someone will be born without the ability to perceive pain and they usually don't survive very long because they have no idea if something's wrong with them. They don't know if they've cut themselves, broken a leg, or ruptured their appendix. And so uh, acute pain is something that we need to have, but chronic aching pain has no purpose. Pain relief can occur uh, in a variety of ways. It can occur at the site of injury, which is the point of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or via central mechanisms, which uh, affected by opioids, endorphins, and pain-inhibiting pathways. So there's this gate theory of pain that you can shut off um, the sort of gate to pain by inhibiting those pathways. That's also oftentimes called the top-down theory of pain, which is why some people um, have higher and lower pain tolerances or can learn to actually tolerate more pain because they can actually use it from a top-down perspective. Pain is very uh, subjective in nature. It's hard to measure. We can't oftentimes objectively measure pain. We can see outward signs. So for example, people who are in a great deal of pain have uh, elevated heart rate, and obviously that's not good. So pain treatment is incredibly important. We refer to this sometimes as nociception, and this occurs when the body is damaged, and injuries accompanied by activation of nociceptive or pain-sensing neurons in response to mechanical, thermal, or chemical injuries. So there are different varieties of nociceptors that respond to um, cuts or bruises, which would be mechanical. Uh, thermal burns or chemical burns are also just uh, are incredibly painful as well. So in the brain, the mechanisms associated with pain are very complex. Uh, pain is thus dependent on t activity of the peripheral nervous system, and its modulation occurs at multiple levels of the nervous system. So it's a really complicated perceptual problem to try to tease apart. Neuropathic pain uh, is caused by a lesion or some dysfunction of the nervous system. 
Uh, it's often characterized by an increased sensitivity, what we call hyperalgesia, uh, to pain producing or even innocuous non-painful stimuli. People with peripheral neuropathic pain oftentimes talk about how being touched makes them, uh, causes them agony or can cause them pain all over. Uh, touching them in one place causes pain all over, wearing their clothes even, and then this constant state of, of agony. And it's really, really um, disheartening and uh, very difficult for people to live with. So when we talk about pain signaling, uh, we have uh, a variety of mechanisms that are happening. Uh, everyone's had a paper cut, so if you look at this um, diagram, you can see there will be pain neurons in your fingertips. Uh, those areas are overrepresented in the cortex, which is why a fingertip cut is so much more painful than, say, a cut on your back or on your forearm. Uh, that goes up to the spinal cord, and then it makes its way up to the paraaqueductal gray, uh, the amygdala of the thalamus and the cortex, all of which, of course, provide various responses. Drugs to reduce pain are called analgesics. Uh, we talk about opioid uh, analgesics, non-opioid or non-narcotic analgesics, which are usually anti-inflammatory, so NSAIDs, uh, or analgesic adjuvants, which are oftentimes antidepressants or anticonvulsants, or NMDA antagonists like dextromethorphan. Um, we'll talk of, uh, about these drugs and their potential uses, uh, but they seem to have some uh, benefit in peripheral pain, particular, particularly. And then uh, tetrahydrocannabinol is also a potentially important way to treat this kind of pain, particularly for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, for uh, chronic pain in HIV patients. Uh, and uh, just basic peripheral um, neuropathic pain. Analgesic drugs modulate pain by reducing peripheral inflammatory response to injury. So one of the things that happens when you get injured is you get an inflammatory response. It turns out inflammation is responsible for a lot of bad things in our lives. Um, it's part of the way the body responds to injury. So by reducing that inflammatory response, you can actually get reduction in pain. So if you're someone who has chronic um, plantar fasciitis, for example, like I do, uh, keeping that inflammation down is an important part of that. So the NSAIDs like um, Advil, I almost said Ativan, <laughs> Advil, um, or other kinds of ibuprofen will reduce that kind of uh, inflammatory response. Icing uh, can also do so uh, by just getting that inflammation down. Uh, you can also block the glutamergic NMDA receptors in the spinal cord using dextromethorphan and ketamine. This is usually called the spinal block. Uh, you can reduce the repetitive activity in injured neurons uh, using anticonvulsant neuromodulators. Uh, and you can modulate spinal cord uh, through activation of inhibitory endorphin or GABA neurons, which again are opioid or neuromodulators. And you can also activate descending inhibitory neurons through opioids or antidepressants. So all of these have a variety of ways in which pain can get blocked. There are also some non-pharmacological interventions that uh, people often try. So for example, uh, a TENS unit uh, can be used to use electricity to try to block pain. Um, there is explorations of transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial, transcranial electrical stimulation, or RTCS, um, or cortical stimulation. Uh, so all of these are potentially in development as ways, non-pharmacological ways to modulate pain. Some people swear by um, acupuncture. It's certainly been around long enough, uh, and so it's something worth trying if you are someone who has uh, a pain problem. So by modulating that central processing of pain stimuli is the way in which opioids work. Uh, so basically, we just don't feel the pain. Um, we, don't, we don't experience the pain is what happens with opioids. So opioids are one of the oldest drug classes known. There's evidence of use over 7,000 years ago. Um, during the Middle Ages, uh, Periclesius combined opium with wine and spices into a drunk called laudanum, uh, which is Latin for something to be praised. It was popular in the United States uh, as an ingredient in many over-the-counter medicines until it became illegal for all practical purposes with the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914. Uh, it was then replaced by heroin use uh, from Turkey, then Asia, particularly during the Vietnam War. Uh, now it comes to us via Russia, Mexico, Colombia, and from Afghanistan. Um, some question about this idea of laudanum making a comeback. There's this drink that people 
um, will often engage in called Cezurep. Some of you may have heard of it, or Purple Drank, where they will c combine codeine and promethazine cough syrup with uh, Sprite and Jolly Ranchers, I guess to make it taste good, because it j just does generally taste awful. Uh, but they will consume a whole lot more of it than uh, is anywhere close to safe. And so uh, this is something to definitely be uh, mindful of, because it is very dangerous. So some terminology to get out of the way. Opium, extracts of the opium poppy, contains morphine and codeine as natural products. An opioid is any agonist with morphine-like activity. An opiate is a drug, e.g. morphine or codeine, derived from the opium poppy. Narcotic from narcos is any sleep-inducing drug. Today we refer to narcotics as illegal drugs. So people throw pot and cocaine into narcotics. Um, endorphin is any endogenous compound formed in a living animal that exhibits the pharmacological properties of morphine. So when we talk about things like a runner's high, it's because you've released enough endorphins to get that same kind of high you get from morphine. Obviously it's of a different nature and a different quality and certainly healthier. Um, but the reason why athletes oftentimes don't understand how bad they've been injured because those endorphins are running so high that they don't know how badly they've been injured. Finally, opioid receptors, there are protein receptors upon which morphine acts. There are three types, the mu, kappa, and delta receptors. We're going to talk primarily about the mu receptors because this is where most of the action that we're interested in will be. So that turns us now to talk about these receptors. So the mu receptor is responsible for feelings of analgesia. This is what gets our pain relief. It's also what causes respiratory depression, meiosis, relaxed euphoria, sedation, sense of tranquility, Reduced apprehension and concern also uh, reduces uh, cough, so all of these are cough suppressants. But one of the major side effects of opioids is reduced gastrointestinal motility. So people on painkillers oftentimes will experience uh, constipation, which can be life-threatening. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, my father had a uh, before he had his liver transplant uh, had some serious issues with GI motility and uh, would suddenly have what we call transient global amnesia. He wouldn't know where he was or what he was doing. It was because his blood pH had gotten so far off uh, because of his um, reduced GI motility. So it's a really serious problem uh, that can cause um, very serious consequences. The kappa opioid receptors are responsible for spinal analgesia, some of the dysphoria and psycho psychotomimetic effects and there's a minimal respiratory depression with the kappa receptors. Uh, Salvinorm A, which is in Magic Mint, is a pure kappa agonist. And then finally, the delta receptors, there's little uh, limited analgesia, but it is possible that it, it exhibits some antidepressant and anxiolytic properties. So what else do opioids do? Uh, they certainly are responsible for respiratory depression. This is what kills people from overdoses of opioids because they stop breathing. Um, the decrease, decre decreases the respiratory center sensitivity to higher levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. Normally that increased level of carbon dioxide will cause us to breathe in, um, but because our respiratory system is so depressed, it simply doesn't do that. Um, Opioids also depress the cough reflex. We call this an anti action. This can be separated out from other actions, so you can get cough syrups that are only cough syrups. Um, can also cause the nausea and vomiting, also causes constipation and urine retention. Tolerance does not build up to these problems, so you don't get, your body doesn't get used to taking opioids and then suddenly you can go. Um, same thing with your pupil constriction. It's very different from the amphetamines we talked about that cause uh, enlarged pupils. Uh, these cause uh, pinpoint pupil constriction. And then some euphoria by disinhibiting the inhibitory effects of GABA on dopamine neurons. So here's a little overview of how opioids work. The limbic system controls our emotions, and opiates act on the limbic system to produce increased feelings of pleasure, relaxation, and contentment, which you can see here in the red. Brainstem controls things like your things your body does automatically, of course, like breathing or coughing. Opiates can act on the brainstem due to, to stop coughing or to slow our breathing. And then finally, the spinal cord transmits pain signals from the body by acting here. Opiates block pain messages and allow people to bear even serious injuries. 
So how do we classify opioid analgesics? Uh, they are agonists. So this is any substance that has an affinity for a mu receptor and exerts the same effects as morphine. A partial agonist is a drug that has an affinity but only partial efficacy, so limited action. A mixed agonist antagonist binds to the opioid receptors, causes analgesia in non-opioid dependent persons, but may precipitate withdrawal in opioid dependent persons. And then a pure antagonist has an affinity, uh, but is devoid of morphine action. So some examples of pure agonist, morphine, heroin, Dilaudid, Numorphine, Demerol, Fentanyl, Oxycodone, and Codeine. Partial agonists, agonists include uh, buprenorphine, uh, Buprenex, which is also in Suboxone. Uh, mixed agonist antagonists include things like pentazacine, uh, butorphanol, nalbufene, and dazoxine. And then finally, the pure antagonists, which are primarily used to treat opioid overdose, which include naloxone, naltrexone, and nalmaphene. Here is a full list of the uh, opioid analgesics uh, in their agonist antagonist uh, action. So, morphine, codeine, and uh, levorphanol are all full agonists, including uh, in the full agonists, which are uh, semi synthetic are oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxymorphone, which is opana. Uh, fully synthetic is fentanyl. Uh, semi synthetic is demerol. And then uh, also synthetic is methadone. Other partial agonists uh, include uh, Subutex, uh, Tramadol, and um, finally we get down to the um, antagonists, um, which include naloxone and um, naltrexone. Morphine and codeine are the two analgesics found in the opium poppy. Codeine is much less potent. <laughs> opium poppies are used to manufacture heroin, which is the most potent of the opiates. Uh, morphine is the most effective drug for p f treating pain. Um, it's used uh, extensively uh, in hospitals and uh, other, um, certainly in um, palliative care. In terms of the pharmacokinetics of morphine, it's usually administered by objection. Absorption from the GI tract is slow and incomplete. Uh, it can be injected directly into the spinal cord to block pain without any side effects, so you don't get any of the um, unfortunate effects of morphine, like sedation and respiratory difficulty if it's injected directly into the spinal cord. Uh, crosses the blood blood, <laughs> blood brain barrier slowly. Uh, heroin and fentanyl uh, are much faster. And only 20% of morphine reaches the central nervous system. It's metabolized into an active metabolite that is 20 times, tw 10 to 20 times more potent as an analgesic. And both have about three to five hour half lives. So this is a drug that has to be administered fairly frequently. Um, most of the analgesic action of morphine comes from that active metabolite. So oftentimes, uh, pain relief may take a little while to get that active metabolite circulating. In terms of the pharmacological effects of morphine, certainly analgesia, euphoria, which affects the positive reward system. It creates a drive state in which need for the drug can outweigh other drives. Uh, sedation and anxiolysis. So the sedation is not as deep. You do have potential for severe cognitive impairments. Depression of respiration, the most dangerous side effect. Suppression of cough, obviously, can be a benefit. Pupillary constriction can cause nausea and vomiting, which most uh, people find very unpleasant. In fact, oftentimes, um, this will necessitate use of a different drug like fentanyl. Uh, again, there's a tendency for serious constipation to be caused by morphine, um, and so you want to watch out for that. There is actually another drug that's available to try to treat that. At some point, you probably have to decide whether or not you need to be taking all that morphine unless you're in palliative care. Um, and there are some endocrine effects. Uh, people report decreased libido and potential for menstrual irregularities. So these are the major pharmacological effects of opiates, analgesia, euphoria, depression of respiration, expression of cough, sedation and anxiolysis, potential for nausea and vomiting, GI problems, pupillary constriction, and then some endocrine effects.
Tolerance to all opioids can develop, and there is also cross-tolerance across opioids. Um, so one opioid will uh, create tolerance of another. Physical dependence can develop. So this is, of course, an altered state of biology induced by drug, whereby withdrawal of a drug is followed by a complex set of biological events. Um, of all the drugs we've, we will talk about, uh, the opioids, uh, opioids really seem to have uh, the worst levels of withdrawal symptoms. In general, they are the opposite of their pharmacological effects, which can include restlessness, drug craving, sweating, extreme anxiety, depression, irritability, dysphoria, fever, chills, retching, panting, cramping, insomnia, explosive diarrhea, intense aches and pains. So very potential uh, for unpleasant withdrawal symptoms from these drugs. In fact, it can be dangerous, um, not necessarily life-threatening, but certainly can seem unbearable. This is, creates a highly motivated state to try to get more drugs to get out of this withdrawal. So oftentimes the physical dependence, um, the need for these drugs is tied to not only the rewarding properties, but to relieve the withdrawal symptoms. And so from a behavioral standpoint, uh, morphine and other opiates have two re reinforcing properties. So they're positively reinforcing, that is, we get that sense of reward, but they also cause negative reinforcement, that is, the removal of that aversiveness, that these withdrawal symptoms. So it's both positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So it's a pretty major uh, whammy. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, other pure opioid agonists include codeine. This is certainly one of the most commonly prescribed medications. It's often combined with aspirin or acetaminophen for relief of mild to moderate pain. So these are the Vicodins, the um, I know uh, Lortabs of the world. They can cause a high degree of dependency in about 40% of users. Uh, codeine is metabolized into morphine by cytochrome P2D6 and many clinical effects are due to that morphine that it is uh, metabolized into. Importantly, there are four SSRIs that block uh, metabolism of codeine into morphine, and we're going to talk about those when we get to antidepressants. Uh, but be mindful of the fact that uh, if uh, the antidepressant you're taking is a cytochrome P2D6 inhibitor, it will cause you to get no pain relief from codeine, and so your doctor will have to choose something else. Heroin is... Um, the, another pure opioid agonist, uh, diacetylmorphine, it's three times more potent than morphine. Uh, its increased lipid solubility results in rapid crossing of the blood-brain barrier, resulting in a rush or high, far more immediate and potent than morphine. It's completely illegal in the United States. Uh, heroin can sometimes be mixed with cocaine, which is called speedball. It affects the offset, the effects offset one another, but create a multi-drug addiction that is very difficult to treat. Hydromorphone and oxymorphone. Hydromorphone, which is dilaudid, is structurally related to morphine. It's about six times as potent. Uh, Long-acting versions of these drugs are available for treating chronic pain in those sensitized to opiates. Amipiridine, um, that's the brand name of Demerol. It's also addictive. Generally used as an intramuscular preparation for use in clinics. It's a really painful injection for anyone who's ever had it. Methadone, this is a synthetic mu agonist opioid. Covers and blocks the effects of heroin withdrawal. It's effective in treating chronic pain that has about one-tenth the potency of morphine. Uh, and about one-third of heroin addicts experience withdrawal for those taking methadone. We call those non-holders. Uh, we'll talk about methadone treatment and suboxone as a potential treatment for um, opioid addiction uh, here in a bit. Oxycodone, uh, oxycontin percanan. It's a semi-synthetic opioid similar to morphine. Oxycontin was intended as a slow release pain reliever for treatment of chronic pain. So the idea was to provide this potent pain reliever that get re gets released slowly, so it doesn't have the high inducing effects of um, morphine or other drugs. Uh, unfortunately, people can find their way around that. They sh short circuit the process by crushing and snorting, or then diluting these in water and injecting them uh, to, to get around that time release mechanism. We'll see the same problem when we get to talking about drugs used to treat ADHD. Hydrocodone, uh, it's a common synthetic codeine used to treat mild, moderate pain, uh, which is metabolized in hydromorphone, again, usually combined with acetaminophen, uh, commonly abused. So, Lortab, Vicodin, Percocet, these are all hydrocodones. Uh, because they are combined with acetaminophen, they have a high degree of hepatotoxicity in abusers. 
So it's something to watch out for. Um, oftentimes the biggest problem with um, these drugs is because of the hepatotoxicity of acetaminophen, they have massive liver damage because they've taken so much. Uh, fentanyl and its derivatives are available as injectables, transdermal patches, lollipops, dissolvable tablets. Um, Long-term pain relief available, but it's a potent narcotic with a high risk of respiratory failure and dependence. Often used in conjunction with midazolam for conscious sedation procedures. So the fentanyl is used for a pain reliever, midazolam is used as a relaxant, and to try and uh, alleviate uh, anxiety and uh, memory for the event. Buprenorphine is uh, another drug available for um, use. It's often called Subutex. There's a ceiling to its analgesic effect. Common side effects are flu-like symptoms. It's a possible medication for treating heroin addiction. Tramadol is a dual, it has a dual analgesic action. It's both a norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, there is a risk of serotonin syndrome when used with uh, SSRIs. So there are three clinically available pure opioid antagonists. They all have an affinity for opioid receptors, but bind receptors with that action, thereby blocking opioid receptors. The primary purpose of these is to treat um, opioid overdose and also prevent relapse. So Narcan, which is naloxone, is an injectable, which is used to treat opioid intoxication. It does precipitate withdrawal, so you'll have to watch out for that, but it will save someone's life, so probably more important to worry about that. Now, Traxone is orally absorbed, uh, potentially as a chronic therapy to prevent opioid relapse. And then Nalmaphene is an injectable used to treat narcotic over the overdose um, and induced respiratory failure. Uh, naloxone is the go-to drug for opioid overdose. It can be safely administered as an intramuscular injection or via intravenous administration. It can also be used, uh, can be administered intranasally uh, if need be. The effect is rapid. Intramuscular injections have a longer duration of e efficacy and are probably the best way to get this drug done quickly. Uh, estimating an appropriate dose is difficult. Uh, it can cause an elevation in blood pressure, but you also have to think about the size of the person uh, and the dose of the opioid. Um, and so this drug is increasingly becoming available um, at pharmacies and through a variety of um, ways to get it into the hands of users and first responders uh, in order to save lives because there are so many overdoses in this area. A couple things to talk about um, to wrap up uh, the effects of opioids before we talk about opioid dependence and tolerance. Uh, there is a phenomenon of genetic anomalies in opiate metabolism that has received increased attention. The cytochrome P450, 2D6, and 3A4 isoenzymes account for over 90% of opiate metabolism. About 20 to 30% of pain, pa pain patients have a genetic opioid metabolic defect in one of these enzymes. Uh, they either require higher than normal dosage and sometimes can be mislabeled as addicts because they keep having to take so much of the drugs, or the opioids build up in the blood and cause life-threatening allergic reactions. So they're either a fast metabolizer, so they're requiring high normal dosage, or slow metabolizers, and so they get way too much buildup in their uh, system. They can also have interactions between opioids and other psychotropic drugs, and there is a genetic influence on opiate effects that occur for a variety of responses. And we certainly are starting to believe that there are genetic predispositions for addiction, particularly to different kinds of drugs. Everyone responds a little bit differently. So one of the things that happens is you get a failure, progressive failure of receptors to initiate a signal after long-term opioid binding, what we call receptor desensitization. This is one of the reasons why people gain such cross-tolerance for uh, drugs in this class. For people who use these intermittently, there is little, if any, tolerance that develops, and the opioids retain their initial efficacy. So these drugs are perfectly appropriate for use on occasion, um, but certainly not a daily use, repeated use, can result in tolerance, and it can become so marked that massive doses have to be administered, either to maintain a degree of euphoria or to pre prevent withdrawal. This is one of the reasons why people oftentimes uh, move from one 
prescription drug onto heroin. So one of the things uh, you'll notice in discussions of this topic are how people end up on heroin and oftentimes they start with these pills, with uh, opioid pills. They get to be too difficult to find. They get to the point where they have to take so many that they're not getting anything out of it and so they transition to heroin, which is cheaper and easier to find. Physical dependence then occurs again when this altered physiological state is induced by the drug and withdrawal of a drug elicits these specific biological reactions that are typical for that class of drugs. So usually the symptoms are opposite of pharmacological effects um, for withdrawal. So the magnitude of the, or of the effects is dependent on dose, frequency, and duration of drug dependency. So this is a huge problem for this class of drugs. As we talked about, the withdrawal symptoms are very, very un, uh, unappetizing. So how do we get people through that period? Because it doesn't last all that long, um, but we have to get them past it. So there are some different ways to do this. There's a clonidine assistant, assisted detoxification. We'll talk about a buprenorphine assisted detoxification and then what's called rapid anesthesia aided detoxification. And essentially, the person is put under the influence of anesthesia for the entire time they detoxify um, and then they are uh, brought out once they're through that, uh, once they're through that uh, time period. Abstinence syndrome can occur uh, following detoxification, which includes depression, anxiety, and drug craving. So these are the acute effects of opioids and their rebound withdrawal symptoms. So we have analgesia, withdrawal sinus pain and irritability. Um, and you can see all of these have a variety of um, acute actions with their withdrawal symptoms. One of the biggest problems we are facing right now is the misuse and abuse of prescription medications, particularly opiates, has really reached epidemic proportions. Since 2003, more overdose deaths have involved opioid analgesics than all other illicit drugs. These include methadone, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and of course, morphine and heroin. According to uh, 2011 data, the number of people ages 18 to 25 who abused prescription drugs fell from 2 million in 2010 to 1.7 million in 2011, but heroin use increased dramatically. Uh, to give you an idea about how uh, serious this has changed, you can see the drug overdose deaths by per 100,000 by type. So while um, all overdose deaths have been increasing, you can see that is almost entirely related to opioids uh, because non-opioid uh, deaths have level off. Um, so we're really talking about uh, all of this increase being due to opioid-related overdose deaths. The age range most likely to overdose from these uh, particular drugs is 45 to 54. In fact, white women in that age group are the most likely to overdose from opioid painkillers. You can see opiates are the primary way in which people overdose uh, at whatever age range we're talking about, uh, but this gets uh, increasingly worse as we get older. And what happens is people start experiencing chronic pain, they have arthritis, they injure themselves, they have surgery, uh, and that's one of the ways in which uh, they end up um, needing painkillers for appropriate uses and then move on to drug abuse. Uh, it's also a time period where people are, have high stress, um, and so it's, they are more susceptible to addiction. To give you an idea of how the scope of this problem has changed, this is a map of deaths per 100,000. You can see the darker purple areas are the highest areas. You can see there's very few places. Um, there's a couple counties in California and New Mexico, and then right around the Appalachia area uh, that really have the highest levels, and this is 2014. Um, really dramatic increase in this uh, problem of uh, deaths from opioid use. So it's something we've got to get a handle on. So how do we um, solve this problem? What have been some of the reactions? Well certainly uh, there are changes in the clinical terms and status of how we uh, talk about this. So there's an opioid dependence and opioid use disorder. Um, addiction seems to arise from um, that arises from medical treatment is called prescription opioid use disorder. So we can differentiate out how someone ended up uh, being addicted to these drugs. Uh, there have been some changes in regulation um, trying to limit uh, the exposure to these drugs, the number of pills someone can get, um, very closely watching doctors to make sure they're not over prescribing, making sure there aren't you know, um, doctors, that's all they're doing. So um, people have made quite a bit of money doing nothing but um, pain clinics. 
So these are draft guidance for um, coming up with abuse deterrent opioids. So things like physical and chemical barriers to prevent chewing, crushing, grinding, and extraction with water or alcohol. So trying to get the drug out from their pill form. Uh, trying to come up with agonist-antagonist combinations so these don't aren't high inducing. Um, different delivery systems, pro drugs that have to be transformed into GI tract. S combinations of these that you know, somehow end up um, resulting in uh, reductions in abuse. So one of the problems with opioid use is what I call collateral damage. Uh, one of the things that happens from people who use prescription drugs is they oftentimes uh, share needles because they end up using heroin and injecting drugs and as a result uh, of a variety of policies uh, we end up with people who have um, HIV infections and hepatitis C infections. Uh, this really came to a head in the last year. In the small town of Anderson, Indiana, they had over 180 cases of HIV infection in one year, completely strapping the town and the county resources and the state resources to try to deal with this kind of outbreak. Um, we've long had pockets of HIV and hepatitis C infections linked to needle sharing, uh, but uh, this has really taken on a huge problem. And so this kind of um, infection can result in long-term treatment costs uh, and certainly uh, long-term social costs because of uh, these uh, kinds of infections. So how do we reduce the co harm caused by opioid abuse? Uh, one thing we can do are develop needle exchanges um, to prevent uh, these kind of infections from occurring, um, allow for the widespread availability of naloxone to treat overdose, provide safe injection sites um, in which people can come, have a safe place, to inject their drugs supervised um, by others, by medical staff. Uh, this has been tried in a number of countries and it's dramatically reduced both drug use and drug deaths. Um, and so it's certainly something to think about. Uh, and certainly increased availability of treatment programs using the best evidence-based practices. And that's where I want to turn next is talk about treatment for opioid dependence. Current evidence suggests pharmacotherapy using either methadone or suboxone with supportive psychotherapy is the best way to go. And that's where we're talking about the best evidence-based practices. Now, a lot of people say you're just replacing one drug with another. That's not the goal of this treatment. This treatment is to transition people from drug abuse to not using any drugs at all. And so this kind of transition time is to move people from one to the other. Without medication assistance, a lot of people can't work or live in the community. And so this is a way in which they can do well uh, with support. So methadone is the classic way this is done. It's a methadone maintenance program. The goal here is to rehabilitate the dependent person and reduce needle-associated diseases, illicit drug use, and crime. The best predictor of success is the maximal dose. Our programs that prescri prescribe doses over 100 milligram daily have higher retention rates than those that restrict doses to less than that. Uh, even at 160 milligram of day, about a third of those are what we call non-holders at once daily schedule. So usually these are rapid metabolizers. Uh, programs reach only about 20% of dependent persons in the U.S. These are often quite controversial. People have to come to the clinic every day. Nobody wants these in their neighborhood. Nobody wants a bunch of drug addicts coming around their Starbucks. Uh, and so it's a huge problem because uh, the people that need help need to not have to travel very far to go to these methadone maintenance programs. And so uh, this is a less than ideal solution, but it is one potential solution. Suboxone, which is buprenorphine and naloxone um, combination, is I think pharmacologically a really clever solution to this problem. The buprenorphine component controls withdrawal symptoms without causing um, any kind of high. And the naloxone component blocks the effects of any other opioid drugs, therefore eliminating the potential for overdose or reabuse while taking suboxone. And it has been shown to be highly effective as a treatment. So the suboxone blocks any opioids and also controls withdrawal symptoms at the same time. And so this is a good, uh, really good choice uh, for uh, treating those who are addicted. At the end of the day, we have to think about what is the most effective treatment strategies and get past some sort of belief that 
replacing drugs with another drug is a problem. It's the best treatment, and that's what we need to think about. Well, before we finish up our discussion of uh, pain relief, I do want to talk about some non-narcotic pain relief options and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, because these are drugs almost everyone takes um, for a variety of reasons. So I want to talk about um, pain management, um, talk about non-selective COX inhibitors, talk about COX-2 inhibitors, and then finally finish up with cannabis for pain relief. Um, so oftentimes we talk about acute versus chronic pain. Um, we'll talk about NSAIDs and talk about steps to take before using an opiate. So acute pain, again, we've talked about already, results from injury, disease, or inflammation. Chronic pain results by a disease itself. It's usually made worse by environmental and psychological factors. It persists over time and is resistant to medical treatment. Uh, chronic pain causes significant problems to everyone, and pain management is an integral to treating chron uh, chronic pain. So obviously important to differentiate between acute and chronic pain. Uh, Non-narcotic pain relievers are commonly called NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These drugs act, act primarily at the local site of injury to reduce inflammation and to block uh, the pain imp impulse from the nociceptors themselves. These NSAIDs block what is called uh, cyclooxygenase, which is what we just call COX, which is an enzyme which is used to synthesize prostaglandins, which cause pain and inflammation. So they block that um, uh, COX enzyme, which synthesizes prostaglandins, which cause that pain and inflammation. Uh, we refer to these as COX inhibitors. COX-1 mediates the GI tract and blood platelets, and COX-2 uh, mediates inflammation. Most of the anti-inflammatories we talk about inhibit both, and so we have uh, oftentimes GI difficulties and thinning of blood. So the effects of NSAIDs are to reduce inflammation, reduce body temperature for those with a fever, it's what we call antipyretic. Uh, reduction of pain without sedation, and the problem here is is we can get inhibition of platelet aggregation, um, that is it's an anticoagulant effect. These are for non-selective drugs only. So some of the things we can do prior to opioid abuse is to try an NSAID, things like aspirin, Advil, etc., uh, to try an antidepressant with a norepinephrine activity for chronic pain, try anticonvulsant analgesics like tramadol, uh, or then try long-acting opioids not um, uh, on a PRN basis or as needed. So I want to talk a little bit about non-selective COX inhibitors and then um, we'll go to COX-2 inhibitors. Uh, the non-selective COX inhibitors inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. The prototypical NSAID is aspirin. We often refer to these as aspirin-like drugs. They are used as analgesics for long-term uh, and for long-term treatment of pain and inflammation from arthritis for those that can take them. They have significant effects on pain, inflammation, blood platelets, so they do thin your blood, which can be good or bad. They can also cause some difficulty in the GI tract, um, so that's something to watch out for. Aspirin is the sort of longest and um, prototypical of these drugs. It's most effective for low intensity pain. Uh, the dosage quickly approaches a ceiling beyond which no increasing effect can be seen, so around 650 to 1300 milligrams. Uh, its antipyretic effect, uh, that is its fever-inducing, occurs from inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis in the hypothalamus. should not use aspirin in children um, for fever. Uh, significant anticoagulant properties of aspirin, this is now used in low doses to prevent heart attacks, uh, basically thins the blood to keep blood clots from forming. Uh, unfortunately, some people can't take these kinds of drugs because they are anticoagulant, people who are taking drugs like uh, Coumadin, which is a blood thinner. Uh, aspirin is associated with an increased risk of gastric bleeding. It is hard on the stomach. Acetaminophen uh, is mostly known as Tylenol. Uh, there's very little efficacy in treating inflammation. It does not inhibit platelet functioning, so it is appropriate for use in people who can't take these other drugs. Uh, it's safe for children, produces less gastric distress, but it does cause significant hepatotoxicity. So limit the use of acetaminophen if you're drinking alcohol. So if you're somebody who um, has a hangover, uh, acetaminophen is the last drug of choice. So you want to avoid using acetaminophen at all um, if you're a heavy drinker. Uh, and it d there is some risk of hypertension in women from acetaminophen. Ibuprofen, which most of us know uh, under its brand name Advil, can cause some gastric distress, but less than aspirin. 
Uh, the over-the-counter dose is 200 milligrams, which is two pills, or sorry, is one pill. Um, the prescription dose is um, 800 milligrams, which would be four um, over-the-counter dosage um, pills. So it is potentially safe to take 800 milligrams. Uh, I certainly don't recommend it because it can be hard on your stomach and certainly thin your blood. Uh, for joint pain, uh, Advil has been more shown to be more effective than codeine. Uh, it's approved as an analgesic and an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, but it does have significant anticoagulant properties, so you have to watch out for that. Other um, drugs in this area are nonspecific NSAIDs like Mobic, Aleve, Daypro, and others. Um, Aleve is the only available over-the-counter, or naproxen is the one available over-the-counter. Uh, it does seem to exert some sort of cardioprotective effect. Well, that's uh, an area uh, of its benefits. I want to uh, turn next to talk about COX-2 inhibitors, because these have had such great potential, um, because they play a role in inflammation and cancer. COX-2 inhibitors may reduce the risk of cancer. They have fewer gastric effects, um, but only one remains available. All of the others will pull, will pull, were pulled for their cardiac effects. So Celebrex is the only available COX-2 inhibitor in the U.S. It's as effective as aspirin in reducing pain and inflammation. It uh, has a 50% reduction in gastric problems as compared to aspirin. It has no anticoagulant properties. So um, it's a pretty good drug to use. Now, if you are allergic to sulfa drugs, this is a drug you should not use. Um, but it certainly um, is an option. Uh, drugs that are no longer available include Vioxx and Vaxtra. Um, they were both pulled to, to cardiac risks. Um, I know people that took these drugs and really liked them, uh, found them very beneficial, but unfortunately uh, they were, uh, their side effects uh, exceeded their potential benefit. The one thing you can take, however, is ginger. Ginger is a natural COX-2 inhibitor. There is evidence that ginger can be as effective as aspirin in treating arthritis pain and inflammation. And it's also effective in treating motion sickness and morning sickness. And so uh, ginger is available in a variety of formulations. You can add it to your diet. You can eat candied ginger if you like the flavor. Um, you can take ginger supplements. Uh, try these things out because they really can be effective. So the final thing uh, I want to talk about uh, in potential for pain relief is cannabis use. It's becoming more and more available. Maryland has approved it for um, medical use. Um, the District of Columbia has approved it for both recreational and medical use. And so I wanted to review a little bit um, of the efficacy of this for pain. It's been shown to be effective for chronic neuropathic pain. It's been shown to be effective for other chronic pains, such as fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis. And there's evidence for efficacy in treating HIV neuropathic pain. And this is a condition that seems to be incredibly resistant to other kinds of treatments. Medical cannabis laws, more importantly, have been associated with significant lower state level opioid overdose mortality rates. So not only can cannabis be used to treat pain, it's associated with reductions in opioid overdose mortality rates. So where medical cannabis is allowed, there are lower levels of um, opioid overdoses because people are using cannabis instead. And so I think this is one of those areas we really have got to get our public policy in line uh, with the science. So final thought here, chronic pain is associated with the worst quality of life compared to other chronic diseases. So it's incredibly important that we come up with appropriate ways to treat pain, but we also have to be mindful of the cost of using these drugs um, because of their addictive potential. It's an area where there's a ton of work to be done, uh, and areas in which I think we're going to see a lot of changes in public policy over the next several years.